A power struggle in Lebanon descends into economic unrest. Will these activists force parliament to form a government or will their protests cripple the country? I'm Imran Garza and today's newsmaker is Lebanon's political deadlock. From one end of Lebanon to the other, people are hitting the ground to tell the government they're fed up. They've rallied against the suspected embezzlement at the central bank. They've targeted corruption reported at a power plant. And they've shouted slogans against a persistent pollution problem that's been compounded by uncollected garbage blocking the streets. None of these issues are new, but they've been exacerbated after Hezbollah made major gains in last year's parliamentary elections. The Prime Minister's ruling party shrunk, and both sides are refusing to make concessions, leaving a critically unstable country without a government for the past eight months. What will end the deadlock in Lebanon? Randolph Nogle reports from Beirut. Chance of revolution. What may be people's last resort? <laughs> Lebanon's government is in disarray after almost eight months of political deadlock. We are starting our demonstration from in front of the Ministry of Labor and we are going uh, toward the Ministry of Health. The system is not working, it's uh, the whole system. Gilles Samaha tells us that for the first time in his life, he's having trouble finding a full-time job. It's extremely bad. You have extremely high rates of unemployment, uh, not only for, for young people, uh, also for uh, older people which are being kicked out of their work without a real protection from this ministry. The protest is cross-sectarian, supported by dynamic new civil groups and political parties like Sabah. We have political parties who build their message, who build their elections on fear and on hating the other group. We don't have the luxury anymore to think about small groups or specific religion or sect. We have to think about Lebanon as a whole unit and to work for this. Nasib is one of many here who feel the sectarian system is being used by politicians to exploit the people they claim to represent. We are demanding that all Lebanese people should have equal rights, such as work and health care, and not to be under the obligation of leaving the country, and not to discriminate against them because of their names or sex they belong to. Some of the people we've spoken to at this demonstration say the protests won't end even after a government's formed. They say endemic corruption that spans the political spectrum is at the heart of the dysfunction and that there's a longer road ahead to putting an end to that. Lebanon's famously complicated sectarian or confessional system distributes power equally between Christians and Muslims and proportionally within their different sects. As a result, protracted bargaining and finger pointing has often encumbered government. But a dispute over cabinet seats between Prime Minister-designate Saad Hariri and Hezbollah has dragged the country into political chaos. It's not normal to wait eight months before having any government for formed only because they are trying to get one more seat or they are trying to escape from the responsibility because they are, say they are saying and they can see that there is a catastrophic situation in the country. Democracy in Lebanon has long been undermined by interference from neighboring Syria and regional players taking advantage of the country's weak central government. Saudi Arabia supports Hariri's Sunni future movement, and Iran supports the Shia group Hezbollah. Foreign influence is widely believed to be fueling sectarianism and an ongoing dangerous game of political brinkmanship. I believe the civil society organizations that began to appear in 2015 will become like a torchlight inside each one of us. And this torch will turn into a big fire that will burn this entire political authority. Abbas is a lawyer and a grassroots activist trying to root out corruption in Lebanon. He ran for office in last year's election in a cross-sectarian alliance in the Shia-dominated South. 
He says he was slandered as a consequence of his anti-corruption platform. Whoever is nominated or challenges the current authority is portrayed as an agent of Israel and a traitor to the homeland. It's a dangerous allegation that could easily put a target on his back. But he says he'll continue trying to bring legal cases against public officials and companies that engage in pay-to-play politics. The reason for all of the corruption is the hateful sectarian system in Lebanon. It generates sectarian leaders who can fully control their communities and their people's fate. Institutions have withered as the political stalemate has dragged on. But in a system so divided, many people have no choice but to turn to their local sectarian power. Those facing poverty in Lebanon have a choice. They can emigrate outside Lebanon or go to their own leaders and ask for help. A lot of people gave up. A lot of people were kind of obliged to, to leave. If you are left without work for one year, two years, after that you have a family, you cannot uh, find a way out, so you could leave the country. It's not easy. I don't blame anybody. Gilles, an architect, has now become a full-time activist. He says changing Lebanon will take persistence. I think it's the end of a period, a political way of, political way of mismanagement, 20, 30 years after the civil war. The corrupted system uh, took 50 years, 60 years, or 100, 100 years uh, to establish itself. So it will need 10 years to, to remove it. It's nothing 10 years, if you see the historical perspective. We think about emigrating to another country because we are looking for a better life. It will be essential to emigrate as long as the situation remains the same in Lebanon. Nasib, a graphic designer, says she'll continue to go to rallies, but she's not sure if Lebanon is ready to move past sectarianism. People should be united. I don't know. Maybe for the future, God willing, for a better life. I hope people will unite sooner and not later. I do have hope, but only a little. For the first time, I feel there isn't any hope on the horizon for former government. This is connected to many things, and one of them is the foreign powers affecting the process of forming the government. It's up to us to decide. It's up to Lebanese people to decide. Either we leave Lebanon or we stay and we decide to do something about it and we decide to be bringing the change and this is what's happening right now. For now, people here hope their flawed government will at least get back to business, while a larger battle looms for those willing to stay and fight. Randolph Nogol, the Newsmakers in Beirut. Well, joining me now from Tripoli in Lebanon is Mustafa Alouche. He's a former MP with the Prime Minister's Future Movement Party. In Beirut, we have the Secretary General of the Opposition uh, Sabah Party, Jad Daher. And also in Beirut is the Director of the Levant Institute for Strategic Affairs, Sami Nader. Sami, let me start with you. People are looking at Lebanon more than half a year on from those general elections. The politicians can't form a cabinet. What's the problem? The official reason and the real uh, reason, the official reason that uh, the different stakeholders are, did not agree yet on a power sharing uh, formula and they did not agree on the number of seats allocated to each one of the major uh, party. The real reason in my view is, uh, is related to the uh, regional dynamic. This is the same reason why you don't have uh, yet a government in Iraq, why uh, the same reason why you don't uh, still have a political settlement in Syria despite the end of the, uh, uh, of the war. And uh, this is why as well you don't have a government mm -hmm. in uh, Lebanon. It's a struggle between the regional uh, powers. Uh, the formation of a government in Lebanon is a bargaining ship uh, today uh, on the table of uh, negotiation and uh, 
And we have, Lebanon has seen similar cases. Right. Uh, let us uh, not forget that the government in 2015 uh, came to, uh, to the command after 11 months of political void. And it was in Davos that right. uh, it was announced through uh, Mr. Jawad Zarif, who said that it's time today to form a government in Lebanon. And it was related to the struggle between uh, USA and mm -hmm. uh, Iran at that time. Right. OK. So Sami is saying the real reason is the regional geopolitics. And I guess if, you know, Sami can correct me if he thinks I'm wrong, but he means the Iranian-Saudi Cold War, the tensions between the United States and the Iranians, the situation in Syria, the Qatar crisis, and so on. Mustafa Alush, Hezbollah says the solution is very close and that they are very close to overcoming the impasse. We believe the solution is very close, said Mahmoud Qamati. Do you believe him? Well, uh, the issue of uh, the government forming in Lebanon is uh, that the problem with it is both essential and circumstantial. So the essential is the quality of the uh, governmental uh, issue in Lebanon, which is related to the uh, uh, sectarian uh, vetoes, uh, inter-sectarian vetoes and inter-political vetoes. But at the same time, the association of these vetoes and this situation with the uh, regional situation. Well, when Mr. Khamati says that the uh, uh, government is close or uh, it can be uh, achieved very soon. This is what we have been hearing for mm -hmm. months. And uh, sometimes uh, politicians say it, say that the, the government is close just to say that they are not responsible for delaying the uh, const uh, construction of the government. But uh, uh, we know that the most important factor now in constructing uh, a government in Lebanon are the vetoes uh, uh, from one part against the other. Right. And everyone is trying to just shift the attention towards the other in, in, uh, in order to say that he is not responsible for this. However, I think that we, are, we, we have come to an impasse yes. in the, our Certainly. situation where uh, no, uh, no one can uh, really push the other, nor uh, any uh, overwhelming power can push everyone towards forming okay. a government. Okay, that's an interesting point. So let, hold on for a second. So if, you, if you'll allow me to bring in Jad, and I apologize for <coughs> interrupting you, but we don't have much time, so I want to keep this moving on. If you allow me to bring in Jad Daher, there's an interesting point made by uh, Mustafa Alush saying there's an impasse, it's the veto power of everybody. We heard from Sami Nader, it's the global, it's the regional geopolitics at play. So isn't the entire political system in Lebanon under scrutiny here. The system seems to be broken. It doesn't work. Well, actually, uh, we don't think it's the system. Uh, we think that, uh, first of all, the issue of the sectarian divide for us as Sabah, we believe that this is just an excuse by uh, the politi political parties in Lebanon uh, to keep the, the grip on their supporters. As for the uh, international or regional problem, uh, I have a question here. Why would a regional problem uh, stand in the way of the formation of a cabinet in Lebanon if it were not for the fact that our political parties currently in Lebanon mm -hmm. have allegiance uh, to foreign powers, allegiance because they are funded by those foreign powers. We have to be realistic here. If we had uh, uh, political parties which are really sovereign, then why would these foreign uh, problems uh, uh, result in the non-formation of a cabinet in Lebanon? Right. And that's a good point. So, Sami Nader, let's look at some of the gripes of the protesters on the streets. A lot of young people across sectarian lines, across the political divide, some of them even wore yellow vests with the cedar tree. They're saying no jobs, electricity cuts, pollution, nobody picking up the trash, lack of health care. That has nothing to do with Saudi Arabia or Iran or the geopolitics. People aren't picking up the trash on the street. How do the two mix? Because you have... Uh a society on one hand and you have the political forces or the political parties on the other hand. There is uh, more than uh, an, an allegiance of these parties to the regional power. There is, some of them are uh, an integral part of, uh, 
uh, of these regional powers. Look at Hezbollah, for instance. This is uh, the military arm of uh, Iran on, uh, on the Lebanese uh, scene. It has an army, it has a system, as a state inside the, the states. And there is a total divorce between uh, uh, the society, the Lebanese society, and uh, those uh, who are uh, the, the forces who are uh, in power. People are looking for their basic uh, rights that those you uh, mentioned, they are demonstrating for to acquire these rights while the political uh, parties, mm -hmm. uh, namely those who have today upper hand on the at the, at the national level they are uh, they have a different uh, agenda they okay. are looking uh, mm -hmm. they have their ambition right. uh, is more than uh, what what the, the aspiration of the Lebanese population let me ask Mustafa Alush Mustafa Alush for those who have that cynical view and they say well the reason there are problems on the ground is because Hezbollah is loyal to Iran and only needs to make Iran happy not the Lebanese voters and on the other hand, the future movement just has to make Saudi Arabia happy and not the Lebanese voters. That's why there are problems on the streets. What do you think? We definitely have a constitution problem. And this constitution needs to be revised in uh, some way. Uh, but at the same time, we cannot do this without having all the armed forces uh, under the reign of the government, under the reign of the, uh, of the state. So uh, when we say that we have a problem uh, called Hezbollah now, uh, it's not because they have a political view or just they are associated with Iran. It's, it's because they have an army, a full army, uh, which is independent of uh, uh, everyone in Lebanon, causing uh, a still uh, a situation which has uh, a great difficulty in, uh, in solving it. This is why we, we are not having a real democracy one of the reasons, definitely, in association with the, the, the impasse mm -hmm. in our political system that has been there since 1943 when we had uh, our independence. Okay, so, Jad, does the man make a good point that while the other side is supported by the Saudis, they don't have a separate army within a state that Hezbollah has? Of course, obviously, this is a problem, and this is why we are calling for an uh, immediate start of uh, real negotiations uh, between Hezbollah and uh, the Lebanese state. Uh, however, we need to uh, clarify a point here. First of all, we cannot keep talking of a constitution problem, uh, especially at this point. We have an emergency uh, public finance situation and a, an economic crisis. We need to form a cabinet ASAP. Now, I don't think that the cabinet is stopped actually by the arms today. What is stopping the cabinet today is the fact that the political parties who won the elections do, are not understanding that it is their duty to agree and uh, not uh, just a luxury to agree. They need to agree as soon as possible. Right. They need to make uh, concessions and to move forward. Now, after we form a cabinet, we can move to a discussion of, you know, reforming some points uh, in the Constitution. Mm -hmm. But we cannot keep talking of big constitutional problems and, uh, you know, starting from zero all the time in this country, while we let, uh, you know, citizens, uh, actually some citizens even starving fr mm -hmm. from food or, uh, you know, no health coverage. We have very, very serious uh, problems in this country. Yeah, and those young people on the street are definitely highlighting a lot of the serious problems in the country. Uh, Sami, I want to ask you about the upcoming investment summit. So you have the president saying we need this summit to boost investment, but Prime Minister Nabi, uh, uh, Speaker of Parliament uh, Nabi Berry is saying, I'm not so sure, saying in the absence of a government and because Lebanon should have a uniting, not divisive role, and because we don't want the summit to be a failure, I think it should be postponed. Where do you stand on that, Sami, this Arab Economic Development Summit? Is Lebanon fit enough to host it? Uh, Lebanon is supposed to be uh, fit enough, and this would have been an excellent opportunity uh, for Lebanon. It comes at a time where Lebanon needs all kind of help in order to get out of its uh, economic crisis, or, or, uh, of its very serious economic uh, crisis. Unfortunately, what happened uh, at the 
uh, a political level, this uh, internal fight we had over the the, the summit. Some uh, some people are asking to uh, to cancel it or to postpone it. Uh, this uh, ended up with um, a, a level of rep representation that is really uh, very low because uh, the, the Arab countries uh, lost hope about Lebanon and they uh, practically uh, you have uh, no uh, chief of state uh, who's uh, coming in Lebanon and this one additional uh, missed uh, opportunity while we would uh, have uh, uh, leverage this event in right. order to uh, 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 finance uh, the different investment program we had. We had at least two economic plans that were prepared. One was prepared by a consulting firm, uh, McKinsey, and another uh, was uh, plan was decided on Paris last year, what they called the Cedar Conference. These two plans need uh, fresh money, need uh, investors, and this event would have been uh, an excellent opportunity to ra raise this uh, money. And uh, once more, uh, the Lebanese uh, political force uh, failed to uh, meet this opportunity. Right. Judd, very finally, the IMF has said that Lebanon's growth will be about 1% in 2019. There are very few jobs to go around. There's political deadlock. If somebody is a 23, 24 year old university graduate, why would they want to stay? They would not want to stay, actually, if we do not take immediate steps, reforms, uh, real socio economic plans, and not only economic plans. It, it has taken our attention that the, for example, the McKenzie plan is called an economic plan. Uh, we see that uh, this country needs a complete socio-economic plan, uh, and this actually is the result of, uh, you know, how we see politics in this country. Uh, we give uh, uh, very little importance to the citizen, his health, his education, etc. Now, in the McKenzie plan, it is uh, mentioned somewhere, but there is no serious social plan. Uh, in, in, uh, in the McKenzie plan. Uh, so this is a very serious issue. This is why if a cabinet is not formed immediately and we see really uh, miracle reforms, uh, then let this political class confess that they have failed mm -hmm. and uh, to even form a cabinet and let us eventually go to uh, early elections and try to find, uh, you know, responsible people to govern this country. I want to say something here which is very important so that we don't see that our country is doomed. The main problem in this country is that we do not have real uh, cross-sectarian political parties which, be, which can become a majority. This is not a dream. This is, very, uh, this is uh, a very realistic objective. In the United States, you have two main political parties. For example, the party of Mr. Alouche, uh, who is one of the biggest parties in Lebanon, does not represent more than 15 percent in the parliament, uh, which means that we are now uh, governed by uh, a big number of minority political parties. What we need are large cross-sectarian political it. parties. Got it. And this is why we have uh, founded Saba right. uh, in order to go into this direction. Okay. It, there is no quick fix in this country, but we need responsible people to move forward quickly. Okay. Well, people are out on the streets. They have been out on the streets. It's going to be interesting to see if the politicians are listening, especially to the young people. Sami Nadur, Jad Dagher, and Mustafa Alush, I'm out of time, but thank you very much for joining us. Coming up on the program, the Ivory Coast's former president is acquitted of war crimes. Is this an instance of justice served or justice denied? And we debate why the U.S. jailed this American journalist working for the Iranian state broadcaster. There's a big debate over the International Criminal Court and whether its system of justice is broken. The latest controversy was caused by the acquittal of Laurent Gbagbo. Many in the Ivory Coast accused the former president of being responsible for a wave of post-electoral violence in 2010 and 2011. But the ICC judges cleared Bagbo and his right-hand man of any wrongdoing. The problem is, if Bagbo is indeed not guilty, an innocent man just spent eight years in detention. But if he did commit the crimes he's accused of, justice has been denied to thousands of victims.
With more, here's Sandra Gatman. The Chamber, having thoroughly analyzed the evidence, there is no need for the defense to submit further evidence. The prosecutor has failed to demonstrate that there was a common plan to keep Mr. Bagbo in power. Those were the words Laurent Bagbo's supporters were waiting to hear, eight years after he was put behind bars in The Hague. Justice prevailed. The truth came out and is coming out the right way. The former president of Ivory Coast and his government minister, Charles Bleu Godet, have been cleared of multiple charges for war crimes and crimes against humanity. The two men are now in temporary custody while they wait for an appeal. This is what led to the charges. It was 2010 and the Ivory Coast had wrapped up a general election. Today's president, Alassane Ouattara, had won the vote, but Laurent Gbagbo refused to accept the result. Violence swept across the country. 3,000 people were killed and half a million were displaced during five months of brutal fighting. Bagbo is accused of using security forces to attack political opponents and cling to power. He and his allies were accused of orchestrating youth groups and militia who raped, tortured and killed hundreds of civilians. When France intervened in 2011, Bagbo was taken to the International Criminal Court, becoming the first former head of state to be put on trial there. He consistently maintained his innocence and says the case was politically motivated. Plenty of critics are asking why, after eight years of detention and a three-year trial, judges suddenly dropped the case. Either the ICC is supporting Bagbo and his crimes, or they are with us. We don't understand any of this. Once again, the ICC itself is under fire for failing to win a case against a former leader accused of atrocities. In the last few years, the ICC's chief prosecutor, Fatou Bensouda, didn't succeed in indicting Kenyan President Uhuru Kenyatta or the Congo's vice president, Jean-Pierre Bemba. The court has also faced criticism that it's biased against African countries and leaders. But Bagbo's defenders say his acquittal confirms the court's impartiality. The International Criminal Court, we believe, has today helped to build its legitimacy. Meanwhile, hundreds of victims in Ivory Coast have been left wanting. Amnesty International says the acquittal of Bagbo and Blegoudé will be seen as a crushing disappointment to victims of post-election violence in Côte d'Ivoire. So, does Bagbo's acquittal weaken or strengthen the ICC's standing as a judicial institution of last resort? Sandra Gatman, The Newsmakers. Let's go to our panel now. In The Hague is ICC spokesman Fadi Al Abdullah. Also in The Hague is the principal lawyer for the victims in the case, Paulina Masida. And in London is the founder of the news site Africa Briefing, Jonathan Offe Ansa. I thank you all for joining us on The Newsmakers. Paulina, let me start with you. Laurent Gbagbo is an innocent man, according to the International Criminal Court right now. How do you feel about that? Well, uh, maybe the right question is how victims feel about that. There was, of course, a great deception on the side of the victims at the announcement of acquittal of both accused. Uh, certainly something that it was completely unexpected. And now, of course, victims are also facing the possibility that both accused be released uh, even without conditions. Fadi Al Abdullah, tell me why Bagbo was found not guilty for crimes against humanity. Well, we are speaking about the decision at the trial level. It's a trial chamber that found by majority that the prosecutor did not present sufficient evidence to demonstrate the responsibility of Mr. Gbagbo and Mr. Blegode for the crimes as charged. Uh, there is still a possibility to appeal that. Once the written decision is filed, then the prosecutor may uh, decide to appeal the current decision to the appeals chamber. So, Fadi, for those who would say that the man was in the dock for a long, long time and he was detained for eight years, yet he was found to be not guilty in the end, as a former sitting head of state, does it damage the credibility of the court at all? 
I think the credibility of the court and of any other court is actually demonstrated by the respect of this uh, court itself to the rules and to the uh, legal applicable rules, legal texts, and the elements of evidence that are there. What has been demonstrated uh, is that the court respects fully the rights of the defense and uh, also the uh, applicable rule. Um, whether the decision of the trial chamber uh, itself has errors or not, that might be challenged before uh, the appeal chamber of the ICC itself, which is another uh, guarantee of the fairness of the proceedings. So um, I think the whole uh, matter is to be perceived as um, in the context of the whole procedure and the whole case uh, that is still ongoing, the court has demonstrated that there are different checks and balances, independent and impartial judges, and the possibility to respect both the rights of the defense, the rights of the victims, and uh, ultimately also to appeal to a bench of five other judges. Jonathan, what does this acquittal mean? Well, it means that um, actually the court, you know, um, has um, respected, you know, the, 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 the rights of the accused. And again, um, also it means that um, the victims, the around 27 uh, victims, you know, who were participating in the trial at The Hague, you know, are going to be denied, you know, their compensation, you know, due to the acquittal. Because um, when um, the current president, Alassane Ouattara, came into power, I think, 2012 or so, I mean, he set up um, a commission of inquiry and um, truth for reconciliation co uh, commission and also other measures to compensate the victims. But because of this acquittal, if the acquittal is upheld, that means that the victims might not right. uh, be entitled to any compensation okay. at all. That's interesting. So let me uh, bring that up and go to Paulina with that. So, Paulina, especially since you represent them, right? So, clearly, just because the court has said that Bagbo is acquitted and Blay as well, and if Bagbo and Blay are released, clearly somebody still killed the people who were killed, the family members of those who want justice and redress, do they have anywhere else to turn if Bagbo and, Bla uh, and Blair are seen as innocent men? Well, first of all, I'd like to um, make some comments on what Jonathan was saying, because actually it's not really correct. Uh, there is, this decision is not final. I think it's very important to say that. The decision on acquittal is not final. This is an appellable decision. The prosecution will appeal it which means that at this point in time, the rights of victim to compensation and reparations remain intact, at least until the appeals chamber will rule on the, on, on the matter. This also means that for victims, there is still an avenue to get the request of justice heard before the ICC. And this goes, of course, to your uh, question, who should then pay uh, if uh, Gbagbo and Blegude uh, are not um, mm -hmm. declared guilty. At this point in time, it's true, they are considered innocent. Uh, there is a first ruling, but it's not the final ruling. Fadi al-Abdullah, Bagbo had said that the charges were politically motivated against him. He'd feel vindicated if the acquittal stands. Does that mean that the charges were politically motivated? No, the charges were motivated by the evidence that the prosecutor had and that the prosecutor team believed to be sufficient, but the judges considered that they were not sufficient. The court is not a judicial body, and the charges have been confirmed before uh, at the pretrial uh, level by the pretrial chamber, which led to the opening of the trial in which 82 witnesses have um, made their testimonies and thousands of pages of evidence has been presented. The question was whether this would be sufficient to demonstrate in the eyes of the majority of the uh, trial chamber that uh, Mr. Gbagbo and Mr. Lebude are responsible for the incidents with which they were charged or not. Jean-Pierre Bemba has walked free, Jonathan. Bagbo might be walking free. For those looking from the outside in, does it prove the credibility of the court or the weakness of the court in gathering evidence? Yeah, before I answer your question, let me refer to um, uh, what Paulina said. What I said earlier was that if the acquittal is withheld because um, the prosecutor is appealing against the acquittal of, right. um, of um, Bagbo, so if it is, it is withheld, then the, the victims 
might not be entitled yeah. to any, any um, compensation. Understood. But to answer your question now, um, uh, it, you know, the, 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 the ICC has, has already been criticized by so many African countries and even by the UK, right? Since its inception 15 years ago, uh, it's only been able to, uh, to, 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 to convict, uh, to, to, well, to make three convictions. And these three convictions are all rebel leaders. It has not been able to bring any conviction, they convict any um, um, high profile um, uh, people like the current president of uh, um, Kenya, um, the, the, the current Kenyatta, president of yes. Kenya, and he's uh, deputy, yeah, yeah, right. yeah, Uru Kenyatta. Yes, but, 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 Jonathan, Ruto, because there's okay? pressure, so, but Jonathan, because there's pressure for them to convict high profile figures, if the evidence doesn't match, the evidence doesn't match, right? They can't do it politically no, it, it, in order then, to go but, for big but, fish. No, but the fact is uh, that is why the prosecution mm -hmm. mustn't be in a mustn't rush right to bring cases before the court. Mm -hmm. Okay, it must thoroughly investigate, right, and and and, and gather you know credible evidence before bringing but such are cases you suggesting, to the court. Jonathan, that and, the and, and in any case, certainly, and, are you suggesting that the prosecution and, didn't have its ducks in order or ducks in a row before it laid the charges and brought the case? Uh, yeah, from the way with, I see it, with from the way I. See, from the way I see it, okay, it appears to be never. Look, since uh, it, the ICC has uh, been criticized so many times, right, that it appears to be targeting African Africans, right, and neglecting the others, okay? Sure. But isn't and that, again, a, that's um, a broader like debate, said, isn't it? That's a, that's a different debate. In well, a it way. is. Yes. Yes, it is. Yes. Yeah, yeah. But um, look, uh, Bemba has been acquitted. Well, one guy also from um, Congo yes. was acquitted, but acquitted was, was later overturned. Right. Okay. The point is, only since in 15 years, only three minor, um, um, right. only three convictions have been made, and against minor rebel leaders. Okay. Right. So that's that should true. tell you something. Okay. Now, okay. That's that's true. So, Paulina, looking at the charges: four counts of crimes against humanity, murder, rape, and other forms of sexual violence, persecution, and other inhuman acts with a bunch of years to, to make their case. Paulina, was the prosecution weak in making its case? No. Um, well, from what I have seen, of course, throughout the entire proceedings, I think that the prosecution had enough evidence uh, to arrive at least at the end of the trial, meaning uh, to continue and not to stop with this no case to answer motion. Um, we had a lot of victims who came to testify with great courage. Uh, we had documents proving to some extent the responsibility of both accused. We have pleaded that before trial chamber. We are still convinced that the evidence presented by the prosecution at this point in time is sufficient to continue with the trial. Uh, I think it's at the end of the day a matter of which uh, threshold has been apply by the majority of the two judges to assess this evidence. And this, unfortunately, we don't know yet, because the majority of the judges decided to rule on the question without delivering the full reasoning of their decision. And, Paulina, if you could give us some insights into the initial reaction from some of the victims and relatives of the victims to the news when Bagbo was acquitted, what was it? Uh, the first, of course, the action was astonishment. It was really um, not foreseen. Of course, victims were prepared um, by myself too uh, about this event, but still one thing is thinking about it theoretically, and another thing is just seeing on the video what happened on Tuesday um, during the hearing. Um, there was this extreme joy on, on, on one side and sadness mm. for, on the side of the victims on the other side. Uh, the words that they used when they were contacted by myself and by my team in the field, uh, they simply said, we consider that our quest for justice was not heard at all before the International Criminal Court. They had a lot of hopes in the court and at that point in time, uh, great deception. They understand still that the decision is not final, so they are still hoping that the appeal chamber could finally heard their voices. Okay. Fadil Abdallah, Paulina Masida, and Jonathan Ofeansa, it's been a pleasure talking to all of you. We'll keep a close eye on Bagbo's 
future. But for now, thanks for joining us. Mrs. Hashemi is also an Iranian citizen because of the nationality of her husband, her late husband, and that is why we have a right to continue to look after her interests as an Iranian citizen who has been wrongfully imprisoned. Speculation is rampant as to why the United States has detained without charge press TV anchor and U.S. citizen Marzia Hashemi. Her family says she was arrested at St. Louis Airport and transferred to a detention center in Washington, D.C. No one knows why. Her employer, an Iranian state-funded broadcaster, says she's being mistreated in detention, having her hijab removed and offered non-halal food. Iran's foreign minister says her arrest is political and she should be released. Well, with more on this, I'm joined in Lahore by Marzia's former colleague and ex-Press TV anchor Kanis Fatima. In Philadelphia is the co-founder of the conservative Tea Party movement in the U.S., Michael Johns. And finally, in Tehran, we have Iranian affairs analyst Said Mustafa Hoshchesham. I thank you all for joining us. Kaniz, are you alarmed by U.S. authorities picking up Mirzia? I am alarmed, um, although Marzi had always spoken about how every time she'd gone to the U.S., and uh, let's not forget she would visit uh, at least once a year uh, to meet with her family, etc., uh, being a U.S. citizen. She, she did say that she faced harassment at airport authorities by the TSA agents with extra checking, interrogation. Sometimes she would have to miss her flights because of these interrogations and this kind of harassment. And she had sort of spoken about how this may escalate in the future. However, none of us were expecting something like this to happen. And so when we received the news, we were very shocked about it and, of course, outraged. The treatment that she had described, how she's been shackled and treated like a criminal, despite the fact that she hasn't been charged with a crime yet or those charges haven't been announced, uh, makes it all the more outrageous. And add to the fact that uh, after speaking to her son, I've... Uh, come to realize that they're holding her under uh, the material witness statute, mm. which means that they're not charging her with anything right now, as far as we know. Uh, and this wit uh, material witness statute has been used in the past, post 9-11, to hold suspects by U.S. authorities indefinitely without charge. Um, and that concerns me a right. lot as a journalist and as a personal friend of Marisia. Right, yes. So material witness, that's a possibility. That's from her son. We still haven't heard from the feds or any other U.S. authorities, so we just don't know. Michael Johns, from everything you've heard thus far, has the behavior by U.S. authorities been justified? Well, it's an unusual set of circumstances in the sense that a material uh, witness in the U.S. would traditionally be issued a subpoena and required to appear before court when you have, uh, in this case, a citizen that is predominantly a resident of Iran and there's a travel ban and concerns about her appearance, it re might require and is in fact permitted a different set of circumstances. What is not permitted is any uh, lengthy detention uh, without an explanation or an issuance of charges. Um, and I would suspect if the issue here is simply one of her providing testimony to this grand jury that presumably has been impaneled in Washington, D.C., uh, she would provide her testimony and provided that she's not a person of interest or a criminal suspect would be um, authorized to leave. If she is, in fact, a material, more than a material witness and in act actually that there is uh, uh, criminal charges, those two would have to be uh, presented to her very quickly under U.S. due process law. And I guess the most important point is I'm a little concerned with some of the reporting and commentary that I've seen globally that sort of suggests that there's a political dimension mm -hmm. to this or that she's being treated differently or unfairly. The U.S. has one of the greatest rules of law in the entire world. Our processes are very straightforward, and our judiciary, I think, as most know, are, is completely separate from the administrative branch of government. So her process will be one of, uh, according to the rule of law, and uh, treated, and she will be, in fact, treated very fairly. Mustafa Hoshchesham, she'll be treated family. She's not a political prisoner. Hello, and uh, thanks for having me. And uh, many thanks to TRT for covering the story. And also hello to Kenny's on the other side of the world. Well, 
As a matter of fact, I, uh, it's no secret that her uh, detention without any explanation uh, is a um, material breach of uh, human rights, uh, freedom of expression, and freedom of the press. Uh, uh, she's been detained uh, apparently because uh, she thinks different uh, from uh, the U.S. hostile policies towards Iran. There is no explanation on her arrest, and as uh, her son has stated, uh, uh, apparently uh, she's been held uh, in jail even uh, as a material witness, and she's being treated very harshly. Uh, we all know that this is a violation of human rights. Uh, but uh, from, uh, you know, an administration that has ignored, in practice, I mean, uh, any, uh, um, I mean, exercising any kind of punitive measures against uh, the Saudi regime that has maimed, tortured, and killed uh, uh, journalist Jamal Khashoggi, you may not expect them to be much different from uh, the Saudi treatment when it comes into practice, when it comes to you know, free press. Okay, they but, are doing okay, double but Mr. standards. Mr. When it comes to Iran, certainly there's, they, there's uh, a lot of blame you know, to go around. Uh, certainly, crying you're, out about human rights. You're mentioning, but, you're mentioning the Americans, you're mentioning the Saudis. There's a long list of Iranian Americans that have been arrested by the Iranians without charge. Some of them had spying charges slapped on them. Some of them disappeared. I can, I can give you the list. I've got a whole list of their names here. So I think, by comparison, Iran's hardly want to talk for for many reasons, when we look at this. I just want to bring Kaniz in and pick up on one of the points you made, Mustafa. You said this is about freedom of speech and freedom of the press. So, Kaniz, you worked within the system at Press TV. Might it be that U.S. authorities have arrested her because of the work she does at Press TV? Might that be the case? Well, uh, it's hard to speculate at the moment, and we're going to have to wait and see how that unfolds and how U.S. authorities explain themselves. But at the same time, for a journalist to work for a news outlet uh, that is based in Iran or based in Turkey or based in Qatar is outrageous. This is a journalist that we're talking about who is reporting on issues in a way that the U.S. government may or may not agree. But does that make her uh, a, a pawn, a political pawn that U.S. authorities can use to pressure Iran or to change uh, policies within Iran? That is something I think we should all take um, issue with, because if that is how journalists are going to be treated in the U.S., then we have a big problem. Michael Johns, if, and again, there's a lot of ifs here and there's a lot of speculation, right? So let's put any other speculation aside and let's assume there is an angle in this thread that's related to the work she does for Iran's state-funded broadcaster. Would that be clamping down on freedom of the press? Yeah, I think it's important to say that just like we would not uh, single journalists out for a criminal prosecution, the fact that you're a journalist doesn't inoculate you from a criminal process. And just because there has not been a public statement from federal authorities regarding her detention yet, which I suspect actually will be forthcoming, does not mean that she hasn't been fully advised and that her family has not, in turn, been fully advised of the basis for her detention. Uh, that, in all probability, is the reason that we're aware that uh, she is being summoned as a material witness in this grand jury case. Uh, there is zero reason to believe she's being held based on her reporting, even though I'm sure there are many issues that could be taken with that. Mm -hmm. Press TV, as I recall, was labeled by the Anti-Defamation League as one of the greatest dispensers of conspiratorial anti-Semitic uh, information in the world a few years back. But that is not a crime, necessarily. Uh, this likely is unrelated to her reporting and, uh, and her, her rights under U.S. law will be fully protected. Right. But, Michael Johns, um, I mean, you, and, you, you keep uh, on you know, saying no this. Sorry to interrupt you. You keep on saying this. It's a higher standard Certainly, you, you keep on saying there's zero reason to doubt the sanctity of the U.S. justice system. But, you know, post 9-11, there are scores of examples. Just like I told Mustafa Hosheshim, there's scores of examples of the Iranians banging up people um, on spy charges and otherwise. We talk of extraordinary renditions. We talk of people like Sami al Hajj, who worked for Al Jazeera, who spent seven years on Guantanamo Bay without charge or trial. People have a context and a reason for knowing that sometimes the U.S. paranoid 
net of justice snaps up whoever it doesn't like within its geopolitical enemies? Well, the Guantanamo process was one that was associated with uh, rule of law related to a global war on terrorism. So, in, in essence, it was more an extension of war than it was uh, a judiciary process. She is now part of a federal judiciary process that has long standing uh, set of standards that are rigidly adhered to and overseen um, and will be, you know, afforded all of her rights and including if she is in fact criminally charged, which no reason to believe she will be, she would be afforded complete due process, including a right to counsel, including a right to uh, potentially appeal the bail and, and all of that uh, nature. But the issue of her being in her of what precisely has happened here is something that has almost certainly been communicated to her. And if it is an issue of providing testimony in a grand in a in a in panel grand jury case, she likely will be providing that testimony very quickly, meaning you won't see a lengthy detention until such time as that uh, uh, grand jury is um, completed. Mustafa Hoshesham, sitting in Tehran. And I believe her children also. Have been, oh, by the way, I so, believe her, ch her children also. I believe have been issued federal subpoenas right. yeah. to appear in this grand jury yeah. process. Yes, her, her kids uh, subpoenaed so to appear in, before the grand jury. At least three right. material witnesses. Right, yes, yeah, certainly. Kids subpoenaed to appear before the grand jury. That's what we're hearing. But a lot of this is from Facebook and from people sharing messages from the kids, from their social media accounts. Nothing official yet. Mustafa Hosh Chesham, is there anything that you heard from Michael Johns, who's a staunch believer in the system, that encourages you that Merzia will get a fair hearing? and that she'll be okay. Let me uh, present you with my uh, assessment of this story. This is not a single case. This is not Marzia Hashemi. Uh, what I see is uh, in the strategic context of Iran and the United States confrontation, the U.S. has, you know, declared an open confrontation with Iran uh, in, that includes uh, numerous measures in areas of hard, semi-hard, and soft war, uh, war uh, uh, warfare. And uh, uh, that includes also uh, silencing Iranian media outlets uh, uh, as a part of uh, the alternative media that are presenting a different image and picture of Iran. You know, the Board of News Directors in the United States, it receives a funding of $661 million. It operates under the Congress, but it received the funding and the budget through the State Department. The main task of this Board of Directors uh, that's in charge of the VOA, Radio Liberty, Radio Farda, and others, is fighting off the influence of opponent states like Russia, uh, uh, RT, uh, the Russian media, the Chinese media, and Iranian media, Al Jazeera and probably TRT, and uh, th this, this is their main task, to silence Iranian media, uh, to uh, eventually isolate, alienate uh, Iran in order to present their own picture of Iran. That's why they've been pre pressing a lot of uh, uh, press TV. Uh, they've uh, been trying to sanction press TV to limit its scope of activities. They have shut down hundreds of uh, media outlets, Twitter and Facebook pages that belong not just to political activists or journalists, but also to Iranian normal Understood. citizens Understood. and uh, average citizens in here. They've been filtering a number of media outlets, okay. English media outlets Mustafa of Hoshesh the Islamic Republic. And I don't know if you're short of time or not, we are. but this is part of the FDD plan for sanctioning four Iranian media outlets that includes Press TV. And that plan has been admitted by the FDD okay. and the White House. Well, I hope you'll all Try and join us again when we have more information from U.S. authorities about the fate of Merzia. But unfortunately, we're out of time right now. And I thank you all for joining us here on The Newsmakers. That's all for this edition of The Newsmakers with me, Imran Gata. Check out more of our stories on YouTube, Facebook and Twitter. Remember to like, follow and subscribe. Until next time, thank you for watching. Bye-bye.